Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 James Sutherland History Lecture by the Institution of Structural Engineers. My name is uh, Mohammed al -Dah. I'm the VP for the Middle East, Africa, and India region of the ISRACT, and I'll be your chair tonight. I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Andrew Smith, who's the uh, convener of the History of Structural Engineering Study Group. So, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. Over to you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, as Mohammed says, welcome to this year's Sutherland Lecture. Uh, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about James and the lecture. Um, James was one of the most eminent engineers of the second half of the 20th century. After studying engineering at Cambridge and serving in the Royal Navy for the last years of World War II, James started his engineering career with Halcro. At the time, in the post-war years, structural materials, and particularly steel, were in short supply, and engineers were seeking ways of building that used a great deal less of it. And James became aware of Alan Harris's work in, on pre-stressed and precast concrete, which uses relatively small quantity, quantities of relatively high-grade steel in comparison to reinforced concrete. At the end of the Second World War, Alan had been dispatched to France to study pre-stressed concrete uh, in the Eugène Fresinet structures in France, many of which had been severely damaged, but could therefore be readily inspected in detail. Um, and at the time, Alan was also reading Fresinet's papers about them. He and James, uh, later practicing as Harrison Sutherland, became involved in many notable structures over the years, in concrete, such as the Lang Span system for pre stressed concrete frames, and the former Commonwealth Institute, now the Design Museum, for example, and in James's case, also in load bearing masonry, such as the student residence towers at the University of Essex. In parallel with his engineering practice, James developed a lifelong interest in the history of engineering, initially of the canals but then later of iron structures about which he talked and published widely and was very widely respected for his work. James set up the institution's group for the study of the history of structural engineering in 1972, which is now 50 years ago, and was its convener for 20 years until he handed over to Frank Newby, another eminent engineer of the later 20th century in 1992. In 1989, at James's instigation, the institution established an annual lecture to be given by someone whose work in the history of structural engineering was considered of unusual value, and to be given to the institution as a whole rather than just the group, initially called the Star Lecture. In 1994, James gave the Star Lecture himself on active engineering history. And it, after that, it was renamed the Sutherland Lecture in his honor. In that lecture, James identified five primary reasons for studying engineering history. Firstly, because it is interesting in itself. Secondly, because it is helpful in appraising existing structures. I would go quite a lot further than that and say that understanding both engineering history and the construction history of a particular structure are essential to the design of appropriate repairs and alterations to it. Thirdly, because the structural engineering of the past gives us a counterbalance to current dependence on codes. One of the attractions for me of work to existing structures is that there are sometimes little relevant guidance in the codes. And so one has to rely on a more qualitative understanding of a structure's behavior and on your own and other people's experience of such structures. And then at the end, you have to exercise your engineering judgment. I find that a lot more rewarding than calculations. Fourthly, uh, study the history of structural engineering because it is an aid to teaching engineering students in greater depth. And fifthly, because it is a means of judging the adequacy and relevance of our present principles and codes and practices. When faced with a successful structure from the past that doesn't comply with our codes, that judgment can be summarized very succinctly as believe the structure, not the calculations. 
And I would add a sixth reason, which Frank Newby also advocated, that we should study the history of structural engineering because it is a treasure house of structural concepts and forms that we can reinterpret to enrich the structures that we design today. By talking about active as opposed to passive engineering history, James believed that the history of structural engineering is not just about the past, but should generate a dialogue between the past and the present for the benefit of the present. James's lecture was printed in the Structural Engineer <clears throat> and so is now available through the institution's website. The Sutherland lectures have flourished. The History Study Group's web page, <clears throat> excuse me again, includes a list of them all under the Resources tab. Many of the more recent have been published and so are also available on the institution's website. James came to all of them right up to his death almost nine years ago now and was working on the history of structural engineering up to a few days before he died. This year's Sutherland lecturer is Dr. Pedro Geddes. Pedro was born and raised in Mozambique, but rather than be conscripted to fight Frelimo, came to the UK to study architecture in both Cambridge and at the Architectural Association in London. His subsequent wide ranging work in architectural research, practice and education is widely respected and now finds him in Brisbane from where he joins us in the early hours of Friday morning for which many thanks Pedro. One theme of his research has been the intrusion of iron and its technologies into a sometimes resistant uh, building culture that is, that's already established as sort of a conservative uh, approach. Another has been how such cultural innovations are transported and imposed around the world. Tonight's lecture combines these to outline the export of British engineering to South America in the later 19th and earlier 20th centuries and its lasting impact on the infrastructure of several countries there. This aspect of engineering history has been relatively little studied. Uh, undoubtedly, it was both a commercial and an imperial venture. In comparison to the wealth of work on how British engineers, for the same reasons, exported railway technology to Europe in the middle of the 19th century, for instance. Well, Pedro, many thanks for agreeing to give this year's Sutherland lecture on nuts and bolts of informal empire, Victorian engineering enterprise in Latin America. Thank you, Andrew. I'm very, very flattered to be invited to give this talk, uh, and I hope I won't disappoint you. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further back be before the 19th century uh, and talk about Latin America, how it was at the beginning of the 19th century. Geography. For 250 years, the Spanish crown retained a virtual monopoly of trade with its American dominions circumvented only by contraband trade. Previously in Peru, the Inca had mined and smelted silver and gold and knew where rich ore deposits were to be found. By the 1540s, Potosi, Potosi high in the Andes, high in the Andes was producing 60% of the world's silver. By quirk of, of, a papal treat, of the papal treaty of Tordesillas, in 1494, Spain's share of the as yet to be discovered South American continent was diminished by Portugal's acquisition of a significant eastern portion of the landmass. On the Atlantic coast, Brazil developed along different lines. There were no significant indigenous empires, and Portuguese settlements were coastal until the 17th century, focused on sugar production requiring West African slaves. Colonial technologies. In the Spanish sphere, the mines at Potosí and elsewhere were privately owned, employing cheap corvée labor and used highly toxic mercury amalgamation processes. Their mineral processing remained relatively static for, two for over two centuries. Stamping mills depended on wooden machinery using water power 
and were unchanged from the 16th to the 18th centuries, as demonstrated in the drawings from the period. Transport, however, was a major challenge. Important mines high in the Andes were accessed across the deserts in, uh, and the, the most um, arid deserts in the world on tracks worn by mules, porters and yamas, carrying small loads long distances. By the early 18th century, uh, Spanish mines were subject to severe flooding. Available technologies, including arrays of um, buckets, relays, primitive pumps to raise water were inadequate to these tasks. There are records from the 1720s of attempts by Spanish mining entrepreneurs to get Newcomen pumps um, to pump mines in Mexico. Later in 1811, Francisco Uville, after investigating the possibility of using Bolton and Watt engines um, for finding, uh, he found that they would not perform at high altitude and he sought help from Richard Trevethick uh, who, whose high pressure engines were compact, easily broken down into small components for transport and worked successfully at high altitude with low atmospheric pressure. Trevithick ended up bringing several machines in 1815 for his collaborators in Peru. After the collapse of the Spanish Empire at rule in 18. 17, the silver mines changed hands several times, but Trevethick remained in South America looking for mining opportunities. Others followed, including Robert Stevenson in 1827. He helped uh, Trevethick come back to, to the UK. Meanwhile, the capital of the Portuguese empire moved to Rio de Janeiro after the king and the court fled there to escape Napoleon's invasion and established a secure base on the major Atlantic sea route to the east. Unlike the Spanish possessions, Brazilian ports were open to British shipping and trade. The openness allowed Portuguese military engineers to, to contribute to the war effort against Napoleon. Little is known about the background to Henry Maudsley's a uh, possible collaboration with Portuguese military engineering contractors, but two 1813 watercolors survive, depicting a steam-driven gun boring machinery in a building with a cast iron roof, similar to, in every respect, to Maudsley's workshop in Lambeth. Gun boring in Brazil would imply that foundries and, heavy, uh, and other heavy industry were developing there. Emancipated Spanish Republics. During and after the Napoleonic War, Spain's grip on its American empire loosened. Throughout the continent, wars of liberation broke out, augmented by demobilizing adventurers from Europe and Britain. At the exalted end of this spectrum, one of the Royal Navy's most audacious sea captains, Lord Cochrane, was recruited by the Chilean government to establish their navy to drive the Spanish fleet out of the Pacific. This he executed brilliantly between 1818 and 1823. Before leaving London as an enthusiast for new technologies and inventor in his own right, Cochrane had begun fitting out a paddle steamer, the Rising Star. The ship had 20 guns and a paddle wheel amidship in a well. Its two Maudsley engines were intended to, to supplement sails, easing, naviga uh, easing navigation as, uh, up and down the South, Amer South America's west coast, renowned for adverse winds and currents. The Rising Star was the first steamer in the Pacific, unfortunately arriving too late for a, for a conflict already won by Vice Admiral Q Cochrane who having cleared the Spanish Navy from the Pacific, helped found the Brazilian Navy, assisting war against the Portuguese crown. On the other side of the continent, the ruins of the Spanish empire 
potential El Dorados now lured British and European investors, stimulated by grossly exaggerated get rich schemes of, for opportunistic promoters and charlatans. Fortunes were lost and speculations uh, in, specu in these speculations, many of which involved mining, such as those bringing Trevithick and Sme uh, Sme Stevenson and others to America. In the emerging republics, Britain, the United States, and European countries established consuls to look after the interests of their countrymen, report on business potentials, and uh, unsuitable local politics, or the vagaries of local politics. Cochrane had established the headquarters, his headquarters uh, for the Chilean Navy in Valparaiso, which subsequently became the station for the Royal Navy's Pacific Squadron from 1813, with shore facilities to maintain its ships. It was there that William Wheelwright, after a full start as an American consul in Ecuador, based his modest coastal shipping operations. His dream was to establish a line of steamships on the Pacific coast of South America. His scheme of establishing lines between Chile, Peru, and eventually Europe matured in 1835, uh, gaining approval from South American governments. He then sought financial backing in the United States. However, American capital was then being invested domestically. So, during, so turning to Britain, he successfully raised funds to establish the Pacific Steam Navigation Company in 1837 with a charter to carry Royal Mail. By 1840, two 700-ton wooden uh, sail-assisted steamers, the Chile and Peru, uh, as you see in the image, had been built at Limehouse, at the Limehouse yards of Curling, Young and Company, with cabins for 150 passengers and a 300-ton cargo capacity, reliable, reliable navigation in the Pacific was finally made possible by British investors and shipbuildings. Once, shipping, once the shipping line was on a sure footing and Chile's credit rating considered sound by British investors, Wheelwright turned his attention to mining in the Atacama Desert. He had seen Latin America's first railway built, linking Calao to Lima, built in 1845. The Copiapo mining, Copiapo mining Company, incorporated under British law in 1836, in partnership with Chilean capitalists, sought to develop rich copper and silver deposits inland from the port of Caldera. To, to improve transportation of ores to the coast and avoid great expense of mule trains and muleteers, Wheelwright wanted a, real, a railway and got his financial backing in London, where he already had contacts and standing. The 41-kilometer line was completed in 1852 under American engineer Messrs. Allen and Alexander Campbell, who brought with them artisans and mechanics, as well as locomotives and rolling stock. The rails, the plant, and the funding were British. Valparaiso. The image here is a proposal of when wheelwrights to, to cross the Andes. Um, once his copy upper railway was established, wheelwrights schemed to build another railway linking Valparaiso to the capital, Santiago, was approved. But disputes soon arose, resulting in resignations of the engineer in charge. And after further complications, William Lloyd arrived in 1854 to take charge of the enterprise. Robert Stevenson had recommended Lloyd, experienced in, uh, uh, recommended Lloyd, who was experienced in foreign railways uh, and his trusted assistant. Uh, he also recommended them to uh, Thomas Baring brothers who were financially involved in underwriting the project. Lloyd found it necessary to alter the route and modify the uh, to modify existing parts of the line resulting in um, the inauguration of the first 13-kilometer stretch in September uh, 1855. 
elaborate ceremonies, as you can see in the image, and um, uh, you, uh, were available for a recently arrived locomotive. The distance between Valparaiso and Santiago is 130 kilometers, but the shortest practical route was close to 190. Lloyd spent 11 years building the railway through difficult mountainous terrain, involving the construction of several tunnels, iron viaducts and bridges, tight curves and steep inclines, all among the very first to be built on the continent. Local, largely rural labor needed training to work in gangs using wheelbarrows and other equipment for, the rail, for railway construction. Nearly everything was imported from Britain, including the coke until coal from mines 500 kilometers south of Valparaiso were found to be adequate. The first iron bridge at Viña del Mar consisted of six 15 meter spans of wrought iron plate girders over framed wrought iron pile, piers, uh, um, sorry, the, the cast iron piers and screw pile foundations. Each span was divided into three lengths for convenience of shipping with all elements tested at the manufacturer, Messrs. Lloyd, Foster and Co. prior to dispatch. The iron work amounted to 150 tons. Back in Britain, uh, Ed Edward Woods, the consulting engineer, overseeing all materials and items manufactured on, for the railway, including bridges, locomotives, rolling stock, needed to draw on his wide knowledge and the fact that he had been the London consultant for the Calau Rima, and Lima line. A more complex iron structure, the Maquis uh, viaduct, had three 30 meter curved plate girder spans with a straight tubular girder main span um, of 45 meters. Manufactured at Brassey's Canada Works, Birkenhead, tall piers made by Messrs. Kennard, composed of wrought iron braced cast iron tubes varying in height with the tallest at 40 meters across the valley. The iron work for this structure amounted to 750 tons and was erected in three months. For the final bridge near Santiago, having had problems with screw piles in the Vina del Mar bridge, Lloyd recommended a 1.8 meter diameter cast iron cylinders, remarking that this system of foundations is best and most economical for bridging rivers in Chile on account of their rapid currents, and frequent liability to floods. In contrast to erecting bridges, tunneling through treacherous porphyry rocks occupied at times 300 miners and took two years to complete. The difficulty of controlling many individual contracts led to, finance, to, to finances becoming strained. So the government, a 40% shareholder in the enterprise, bought out private interests and with the approval of Messrs. Bering and Bering Brothers, took on completion of the line with Lloyd's as the responsible engineer. Instead of continuing with piecemeal contracts, Henry Meigs, an American exile from California who had successfully built Chile's Southern Railway, was contacted to complete the Valparaiso to Santiago line. In addition to plate girders, the 138 kilometer Southern Railway had wooden bridges and some 35 millimeter Bowman trusses combining cast and wrought iron. In Brazil, when the Portuguese court left Brazil in 1821, the Prince Regent, Dom Pedro, remained to become Viceroy of the vast territory that reverted to its pre to, that had reverted to its previous colonial status. However, the Brazilian elite agitated for independence from Portugal, and after a short war, Pedro I was proclaimed emperor in 1822. Unlike its republican neighbors, Brazil expanded a panoply of titles and protected ownership of slaves. During this time, Irineo Evangelista de Souza, better known as Baron Moir, 
proposed the first 14.5-kilometer railway along the coast near Rio de Janeiro, eventually completed in 1854 and built by Edward Brainerd Webb. There were plans for its extension, for, for the line to extend to Petropolis, the emperor's summer retreat, but taking the pathway, taking the railway up the Serra do Mar escarpment was too difficult and a macadamized road was built instead. Before the end of, of, 18, of the 1850s, capital was raised throughout through Rothschild in London, with the Brazilian government offering an attractive 7% guarantees. This system of finance, along with the advantages offered by limited liability companies, made these ventures attractive to British investors. On such one such line, the Bahia and San Francisco Railway was begun in 1856 with Charles Blacker Vignoles as chief engineer. He designed the line, specifying and certifying materials in London, communicating by mail with his son Hutton, who had surveyed the line. The first stage, 123 kilometers, was completed in 1863. Uh, as far as Algoinas, uh, with several tunnels and plate girders, bridges, similar to those being erected simultaneously by Lloyd and Chile. Stations and buildings here had considerably more prefabricated ironwork sent from Britain, only three weeks away by steamer. At the 126-kilometer Pernambuco line from Recife to Palmares begun in 1855, had 17 spans of pin-jointed Warren trusses supplied by the viaduct works at Crumlin, probably the first such innovative spans in South America. One of the viaduct works directors, R. W. Kennard, was also a director of the railway and connected with the bank that financed the project. Michael Penniston, the resident engineer in Recife, uh, with James um, Meadows Rendell as consulting engineer in London. The state of Purmanbuku was a forward looking was forward looking at the time, with William Martineau as municipal engineer to the city of Recife, where he built road bridges designed by Edwin Clark, some of which were manufactured by E. T. Bellhouse of Manchester. Uh, who were also responsible for the Pernambuco gas works. <clears throat> Prior to going to Brazil, Martinu had worked with Lloyd on the Valparaiso to Santiago Railway. The Bahia and Pernambuco line were both built to service the rich sugar, rich sugar and other plantations along the coast with ambitions of extension into the mining areas of Minas Gerais. Conditions on the Conditions on the contracts of both lines explicitly excluded the use of slave labor, but questions were asked about strict compliance. Baron Mawa, ever, ever the keen entrepreneur, had obtained a concession in 1853 for the, for the 142 kilometers Santos to Jundia railway, setting, setting off from Camp Santos, an island port on the coast, the railway climbs a steep 800 meters of the Serra do Mar, after which its journey to Sao Paulo and Jundia across the plateau is relatively uneventful. James Brunley's was appointed as the Baron's representative in Britain in 1856, and he sent Daniel Mackinson Fox to Brazil to survey the line and report on the feasibility of building it within tight cost constraints. Fox, having worked in mountainous regions of Spain and elsewhere, was considered eminently suited to the task, but surveying through dense jungle and across land subject to washouts caused by intense tropical downpours was difficult indeed. The steep escarpment appeared the major challenge, and given the money available, Brunley's decided to employ stationary engines and cables. The Mugi Viaduct 
in this section includes wrought iron lattice girders uh, co contracted from uh, Messrs. Robert Sharp and Sons. All plant and machinery, bring, bridges, etc., were sent from Britain, including the stationary engines built by William Fairburn of Manchester. In 1860, work commenced and the railway was completed ahead of schedule in 1867. This line and its later extensions enabled coffee, cotton, and other valuable crops grown on the plateau um, to become major exports of Brazil through the port of Santos. The line known as the Sao Paulo Railway and largely owned by British shareholders enabled growth of the Sao Paulo and the Brazilian hinterland. In Argentina, until 1850, until the 1850s, Argentina was made up of heterogeneous, sometimes united provinces and cities. And its first railway built in 1857 was financed by local capitalists. It ran for 10 kilometers from Buenos Aires to the village of Floresta. From Rosario, a port on the, on the navigable Paraná River, rail transport to Cordova, a well-established city 400 kilometers from Buenos Aires, was proposed and eventually built. This line, the Central Argentinian Argentine Railway, was later extended, as was, as was the entirety, uh, entirely separate uh, Great Southern Railway, begun in the same time and promoted by Edward Lum, a British entrepreneur resident in Buenos Aires. From the mid-1870s, the railway network of Argentina expanded enormously, endowing the country with complex network built by British engineers and capital. On the South Amer it, as in other South American countries, the government would guarantee a yearly return of 7% on such investments. Thomas Brassi, the contractor who built the Rosario to Cordova line, took part of his payment in land grants. This approach proposed for colonization of India by Roland MacDonald Stevenson in the 1840s was used successfully in the USA west and west of the Mississippi and in Canada. And you can see on the, on the extract from this map of part of Cordoba showing such land arrangements being made. Patterns of land ownership along rail lines are seen on maps of agricultural districts around Cordoba. This area absorbed large numbers of Italian and other Im immigrants who settled in parts of the country being opened up and unified by railways in both Chile and Argentina. Railways were also used as instruments of territorial conquest, asserting sovereignty over First Nation peoples. Adaptations in South America. In Chile and Peru, both seismic zones, masonry piers were never used and cautious, cautious, cautions were taken with iron structures. Unforeseeable hazards such as rockfalls, mud washouts often took their toll. The much admired Verrugas um, bridge was swept away in 1889 when one of its piers was destroyed to be replaced in 1891 with a wider span. This bridge, made by the Baltimore Bridge Company for Henry Meigs, Calau to Arroyo Railway, became a symbol of progress, featuring prominently on the masthead of uh, Peru's leading magazine and rapidly replaced after the charity, uh, uh, after the tragedy, the, the masthead was replaced. Uh, Meigs started, started many other Peruvian railways initially using British and French iron bridges, but later opted for American structures, claiming that pin joint joints and standardization made them cheaper and far quicker to erect than European spans. One such bridge still remains in Arequipa with its spidery fink trusses and phoenix columns. While Meigs favored um, American bridges and rolling stock, the rails and much of the plant came from Britain as did the coal fire, coal to fire that boilers. In Chile, in Chile the Biobio Bio River, 
had been a major barrier to expansion, but the bridge built by the mining magnate T.J. North in 1889 to reach the region's uh, rich coal, f- coal fields helped unify the country. The structure was a 1.9 kilometer was 1.9 kilometers long, made up of 63 equal lattice girder spans of 24 meters, supported by clusters of six cast iron columns founded on solid ground 10 meters below the riverbed. The ironwork designed by Edward Manby, chief engineer of the Arauco Company, was supplied by John Butler and Co. or Stanningley Leeds. In Chile, railways built at right angles to the coast to access mineral deposits traversed arid areas and where where engineers devised methods of distilling seawater and brackish water rendering rendering them suitable for boilers. The remote northwest Argentinian railway had to cross 16 rivers of varying widths. It was decided to standardize all bridge spans to 30 meters so that they could be erected in convenient yards away from the site and carried there on three platform trucks. Well foundations in brickwork rendered externally in Portland cement were sunk to firm ground below the riverbed. These were filled with rubble mixed with cement. This method borrowed from India, avoided cast iron cylinders subject to breakage and difficult to sink accurately. Where wider spans of up to 100 meters were needed, more demanding fabrication techniques were required. The Imperial Dom Pedro II bridge on the Brazilian Imperial Central Bahia Railway crossed the Paraguasu River, linking the town of Cachoeira with São Félix, designed by James Clemenson to eliminate the need of skilled labor. He utilized material in the condition it left the rolling mills, almost entirely avoiding forge work with all holes drilled by specially by special machines um, to hold linear elements together in their proper relationship thus avoiding multiple handling of components. To quote, um, Handyside of Derby, Handyside of Derby consulted R. M. Ordish in 1871 on building bridge abutments entirely of iron using Robert Mallet's buckled plates. Henry Maynard of the Crumlin Viaduct Works had designed a similar uh, system using plates and screw piles, explaining that everything could be made in Britain uh, and that such abutments could be erected rapidly by the same crews putting the ironwork together for the bridges. Later in 1877, on his visit to to Argentina, Edwin Clark recorded flooding on the Pampas Plains that had swept away large areas of older railway tracks, including bridges. In this landscape, there was no suitable or readily available stone for ballasting track, so it had to be brought in over long distances. Back to uh, Valparaiso. Arriving in 1854 with his family as, as the city became the principal emporium on the Pacific coast, boosted by the California gold rush, British manufacturers keen to find a market for their goods sent commercial agents and catalogues promoting their wares. One such illustrated and expensively produced brochure was issued in 1857 with parallel texts in Spanish and English under the name of Charles D. Young. Listed as representative in Chile was Frederick William Etheridge, whose previous career in Britain had been an inventor of brick-making machinery. The frontispiece was dedicated to a leading Chilean capitalist with a colored lithograph of a pier built on the James Dredge suspension principle for everyone to see in Valparaiso. Inside, a cornucopia of products ranging from railway plant, rolling stock and equipment through distillation sills, bridges, steamers, sawmills, iron buildings, steam engines, farming, mining equipment, gas works, and ornamental castings, 
uh, Etheridge explained. In his recent visit to England to connect himself with several of rate, first-rate houses through whom he is enabled to supply the various articles specified in this book to purchases either wholesale in wholesale quantities or to meet their casual wants. Carrying heavy manufactured goods from Britain, uh, bal from Britain ballasted ships, so favorable freight grates were offered to compensate for lighter cargoes of Manchester goods from Britain's textile mills. In the 1850s, Chile exported copper and silver ores for smelting in Cornwall and large volumes of agricultural products from Concepcion, south of Valparaiso, uh, to the hungry miners in California and Australia. This trade was memorialized in a large cast iron monument made by the Colebrookdale Company for the Plaza de Armas of Concepcion. The 15 ton Corinthian column with fountains and lights, light fittings, is crowned by a statue of flora celebrating agriculture. Lloyd became an important member of Valparaiso's British expatriate community. The Admiral commanding the Royal Navy's Pacific Squadron stationed at Valparaiso offered, to help, uh, offered the, the help of his sailors to unload locomotives and other heavy materials for Lloyd's Railway. Asked to design the Anglican Cathedral in an, in an English style with a timber hammer beam roof, Lloyd's modest building could not proclaim its ecclesiastical purpose with a bell tower or any other architectural feature without strong objections from the all-powerful Catholic Church. But he built Val Valparaiso's railway station and also designed the city's municipal market. English banker David Thomas, resident in Valparaiso, then commissioned Lloyd to develop a tramway system for the city. When the tracks were laid, the first 25 distinctive double-decked horse-drawn streetcars manufactured in New York began serving the port. In 1863, it was the second such system in South America after Santiago and um, Rio de Janeiro. In Peru, as, as early as 1849, through the Liverpool firm of Graham, Kelly and Co., Edward Woods had, had superintended the materials acquired in Britain for the Lima and Calau line, establishing his long and varied professional links with South America. In 1851, among, among other Peruvian projects, Wood designed a 670 meter pier on screw piles for Pisco, the port servicing the Chincha Islands, Peru's source of guano wealth. Such ports on the west coast needed piers and needed piers that extended well beyond the surf line. Later in 1854, in his capacity as consultant to the Peruvian government, Woods commissioned E.T. Bellhouse uh, of Manchester to build and send out a customs house and warehouse for the port of Paita in the north of the country. Wood became, Woods became consulting engineer for materials from British rolling mills and foundries for all of Henry Meigs railways and other projects in Peru, supplying rails, much of the plant and equipment, as well as some bridges. In Argentina, Woods was involved in railways. From 1863, he was appointed consul consulting engineer for the central Argentine Rosario to Cordova line with his son Harry as resident engineer until completed in 1870. Other projects in Argentina followed, including several developments in Buenos Aires port area for which he designed a bridge in 1886, spanning 76 meters across the Riachuelo. Three years later, it was Wood's long relationship with Chile that brought him the project for a viaduct over the river Loa on the Antofagasta line, 
It has seven modest spans of 24 meters, but is carried on, a spe on spectacularly tall piers, some over 100 meters high. Here, instead of using cast iron column sections, he employed Phoenix columns, an idea borrowed from the American practice, used successfully on the Verrugas viaduct and the Bolivar Bridge in Arequipa. Beyond railways, Henry Driver was a civil engineer and architect who had made a name for himself as an expert in iron buildings with particular skills in ornamental castings. In 1869, he was chosen by Woods, acting as consultant to the Chilean government, to design the central market in Santiago. There, there he created a tour de force in ornamental cast iron, which still stands. During his lecture at the RIBA, on iron as a construction constructive material in 1875, Dreiber presented drawings of the market and photographs of the structure. Prior to its export, it had been erected in the Glasgow foundry of Laidlaw and Sons with, with clear numbering of components for easy assembly on arrival. At the RIBA, Driver's lecture <clears throat> brought together many of the principal manufacturers of ornamental cast iron, including Walter McFarlane, for whom he had designed many castings, increasing the vast repertoire of the Sarathus and Foundries catalog, some special editions of which featured texts in Portuguese for the Brazilian market. Also present was Ewing, Ewing Matheson, export manager of Andrew Handyside and Company of Derby, who had recently published two versions of his works in iron, showcasing Handyside's bridges, roofs and buildings, machinery and ornamental castings. These publications, thinly disguised as textbooks, textbooks were aimed at promoting the company's wide-ranging expertise and global reach, showing examples of current products. In 1878, Matheson published the first volume of his aid book for engineering enterprise ab abroad. It went into great detail about securing financing, initiating and supplying large overseas engineering contracts with the products of British industry, as well as its professional services, clearly drawing on a fund of personal experience in the important export field. Much of the volume was about railways, bridges, and urban utilities, but the last chapter focused on municipal markets at a time when growing cities in South America were contemplating building produce markets to regulate and tax small traders. By the 1890s, iron structures for market buildings were being exported and erected in Brazil and Argentina. Of particular note for its structural innovation was Max van Amende's La Plata market for the Compañía de Mercados y Frutos. His structure of, of three clear spans of 25 meters was built by Derbyshire's long-established Butterley Company in Alfreton. Nearly the world's largest market, nearby the world's largest market building was situated on the right bank of the Riachuelo River in Buenos Aires. It was designed by the engineer Ferdinand Moog, formerly of the Great Southern Railway, and covered an area of 126,370 square meters on three levels. 2,434 wrought iron phoenix columns made, made by Dorman Long of Middlesbrough were each delivered in a single piece 12.5 meters long and stood closely spaced on a grid of 4.3 meters to avoid heavy foundations on the poor soil. The contractor for the 20,000 tons of ironwork, ironwork was J. Lysart of Bristol. The vast structure was intended to collect agricultural products via its internal rail docks, served by 78 hydraulic lifts, 
for shipment from the wharves. The top floor roof had a southern exposure designed to provide even daylight for wool grading. Farming and pastoral colonists brought to Argentina's pampas and hinterland by, by the railway network created a surplus of agricultural products for export. Buenos Aires and other ports, large grain elevators, many of them owned by railway companies, facilitated loading directly onto British and European ships to countries reliant on imports. Argentina had, had long been a major producer of hides and salted meats, but the development of refrigerated transport enabled fresh beef and lamb to be sent efficiently economically to Smithfield markets and elsewhere. To make this lucrative trade possible, Buenos Aires and Argentinian ports needed enormous investments of capital, civil engineering expertise, and equipment such as dredges and other large machinery, a subject worthy of separate detailed treatment. Returning to Charles Driver, engaged, engaged in 1896 by the British owner of the Sao Paulo, British owned Sao Paulo Railway and a, a Daniel Mackinson Fox for his expertise in straddling engineering and architecture. Fox had continued with the company after taking the railway successfully up the Serra do Mar. Sao Paulo had by now grown into a prosperous city at the center of the coffee growing region, doubling its rail tracks to include a further line on the Serra. Driver's task was to design uh, several stations, including the central uh, Station de Luz. Designed as a spectacular Edwardian confection with very large steel arched roof over the tracks, it stretched parallel to the masonry pile housing the company's administration. The steel work for the arches was rolled by the Earl of Dudley's round oak works, fabricated and erected by Joseph Westwood engineers and contractors uh, at Napier Yard in Millwall. The station's cast iron columns, railings, spandrels, embellishments, and other products were by Walter McFarlane's Glasgow Saracen Foundry. Driver had specially designed the ornamental ironwork for the refreshment stall for the foundry, culminating a long relationship with McFarlane. Uh, similar, similarly, uh, a new Estación Central, Retiro, was required for the Buenos Aires termina termina terminating the South Argentine Railway. Projects were begun in 1908 by Eustace L. Conda, an architect who had emigrated to Argentina in 1888, by then working in partnership with Sidney Follett. The befittingly monumental Beaux-Arts head buildings front a pair of 50 meter span parallel arched train sheds with engineering by R. Reynolds, who also designed the structural framing for the head buildings. Steel work was fabricated by Francis Morton of Liverpool using Dorman Long sections, totaling 8,000 tons. The facades of the dome terminus face an enormous plaza where large clock towers, where a large clock tower uh, was formerly known as the Torre de los Ingleses in the Plaza Britannica. This public monument and the name of the plaza saluted in earlier days the role that British had played in the development of the country. On the other coast of the continent, the Arco Britannic monument uh, erected in uh, Valparaiso commemorated the country's first centenary, memorializing four British born heroes of the Chile's War of Independence. The extent of the debt or dependence on British enterprise can be illustrated by the fact that in, 19, in the 1930s, Argentina's 38,500 kilometers of railways largely built by materials manufactured in Britain and moved by steam, generated by Welsh coal, uh, 
were 60% owned by British shareholders. Conclusion. In 1878, Huey Matheson said railways, said of railways, the amount of British capital expended in the construction of railways equals or exceeds that invested in all other modern public works put together. This short survey has, leaves out major areas of enterprise taken to South America by engineers, entrepreneurs, speculators, and financiers. These would include accounts of major infrastructure projects like monumental waterworks and drainage systems for Buenos Aires and other cities, countless gas works, street lighting and paving, tramway systems, some of whose names hold on to the memory of their original of their origin like the bondes in Bra the, the Brazilian street, car street cars that remember that they were financed by bonds, promise, promised good returns for investors from Britain. These narratives could digress into great, the great harbors of Buenos Aires, Rosario, Calao, Rio, and Valparaiso, all monumental works of marine construction, dredging and integration with railway systems. Not to be forgotten, would be the floating docks that enabled liners to be repaired in Peru, large steamships made in Scotland and taken apart uh, and transported on the backs of mules to be re reassembled on the shores of Lake Titicata, high in the Andes. Accounts of technologies related to agriculture and sugar processing and refining, grain collecting, milling and export, meat processing and refrigeration, making it possible for Argentinian and Uruguayan beef and lamb to find its way onto the dinner plates in Britain. Mining in remote places and the technologies developed to extract value from ores through the brute, through brute force of heavy machinery to exquisitely complex process of the refining would add another chapter. Communication systems such as reliable mails made possible by regular steamships scheduled as well as telegraphs brought managers of enterprises and resident engineers in the Americas into reliable and rapid contact with their counterparts in Europe. Telegraphed orders as well as reports on the performance of investments and the latest news on volatile political developments all helped shrink the world for those with access. Other less edifying stories that come with the industrial technologies of the 19th century included the purchase of armaments, particularly for the navies of the continent's republics, as well as the exploitation of workers, particularly First Nation peoples in the Amazon uh, in the ruthless pursuit of rubber. All in all, mixed blessings, but these worlds were certainly transformed by the technologies of making and building and innovations in financing reliant on free trade government guarantees on investment in limited liability companies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro, for that fantastic presentation. And thanks for the beautiful slides. Um, this is really very, very interesting stuff. Um, we have got the first question, actually, to, to kick off the, the, the question and answers. I hope our viewers can access that. And uh, please note, we will accept the questions uh, in the question box being typed. And I will read them out to Pedro, and Pedro will answer them verbally. So we'll start with the first question, which is from Andrew. Um, he's asked us that, uh, was the railway that features in Joseph Conrad's Nostroma British in origin? So if you can help us. Okay. I, I can't help you with that because I'm I'm not um, I, I haven't I confess I haven't read Nostromo, so um, but it 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 could be well even if the even if the engines weren't British the the, the rails might have been. Fantastic! Thank you very much. We have another question from Nick von Burr. Um, do you have any good examples of the early use of reinforced concrete and cement in the region? Um, I, I, th I think the, um, I, look, I, I, I know that in Argentina there were um, 
quite uh, early uh, grain elevators using um, reinforced concrete. I think they were, uh, the technologies were coming from the United States. Uh, the, the French were very big on um, reinforced concrete. I mean, there are people like Hennebeek had uh, agents throughout uh, the, the, the world. Um, and, and particularly, I mean, one of, one of, the, one of the things that, that I think, um, I'm, I'm, I need to look into this more carefully, but I think the, um, a, a, a lot of South American uh, republics actually uh, valued uh, British technology engineering but they were very skeptical about uh, the, the British taste in architecture. Um, uh, they, 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 they were not terribly enthusiastic about the Gothic revival or anything like that. And, and they, they favored French um, kind of design in that sense. So a city like uh, Buenos Aires uh, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, ended up cutting some diagonal boulevards in imitation of Paris, you, you know. So, so there were, I mean, there were different, different influences in different places. But look, I don't know an, an enormous amount about concrete, but concrete actually did become a very uh, kind of normal material in places like Brazil uh, in the 40s and 50s. But, I, but the period between uh, that is, is quite, um, I'm, I'm sure there are Brazilian scholars looking into that and from other countries. And, and actually the, the scholarship on these issues has increased enormously in, the, um, in, in Spanish America and, and in Brazil. Uh, thanks, Pedro. Thank you very much. Well, the questions are flooding in now. Well, the next one, uh, is from sorry uh, Andrew. Yeah, can I just add something to to the response to Nick from Bear? Um, in between the two world wars, um, Germany uh, started exporting quite a lot of concrete technology to South America. Um, things like the Dijkhoff and Wittmann uh, shell structures start popping up in the early 30s in South America. So uh, all sorts of people were at it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got a few questions now, so I'll just run through them. Uh, the next one is from Malcolm, I think from Portugal. Um, he, he's asking, how many of the projects you've showed still exist? Um, quite a few, quite a few of them. Look, the, the, the market in Santiago still exists. I've visited it. Uh, there, there is a, um, a, a fantastic uh, Fink Trust Bridge in Arequipa that was built by uh, Meigs. Uh, Meigs. Uh, the, 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 the bridge with spans of 100 meters at, on the Paraguasu River is still existent. I, had a, I, I, I went there and had a good look at it. I mean, quite a few of these structures are um, still in existence. Uh, the Chileans are very keen on preserving them. Um, some of the structures are very um, uh, cared for in in Argentina, but many many of these things are neglected and replaced uh, because they they are inadequate for the um, for the loads that they need to carry and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, it's it's a, a mixed. Um, heritage. Thank you, Pedro. Um, the next one is from Tanuja Singh. Uh, her question reads, uh, it's indeed awesome to know that all these structures were designed manually without software. How was corrosion protection done for the steel and how is the erection done? And I suppose that the crane was not available then. Thank you. Um, there, there, there were uh, there were different types of, of, of crane, cranage, right? And um, I mean, one of the things about most bridges on 
the railways were, were actually quite short. You know, they were 30 meter spans as the uh, 100 foot, as the, you, you know, people would try and get spans of 100 foot. And occasionally they had to get, they had to use something a bit wider. I mean, the reason why the Verugas uh, viaduct got swept away is that one of its legs was in a, a, a place which they shouldn't have put it. It was in a kind of a, a, a riverbed and uh, rocks came down the river and took the, took the, the thing away. But um, I think that, that there were, uh, I mean, a, a across some of these very wide valleys or, or very deep valleys in the Andes, very sophisticated techniques were developed using cables to, um, I mean, there was aerial ballet in the erection of these, um, of, of these structures. And, um, you, you know, and, and normally, I, I mean, these things would, would, would be broken up. I mean, the, the bridge that, uh, that Lloyd built, the, f the first bridge that Lloyd built in the published drawings, there, it shows that the the, um, the lengths of the pieces that were sent in the boats before they would have to be riveted together uh, in uh, on the site or nearby. But um, the thing about uh, most railways, uh, most railways that that actually worked and were successful, actually had to have quite uh, elaborate workshops to maintain all the rolling stock so there, there were people around who could actually do riveting and um, do some of those tasks but the whole business of how these structures were erected is a big subject and it's actually worthy look worthy of study what about the the protection the corrosion protection Pedro? the, the cor corrosion protection um is it paint? Uh, I, I think they, they, they rely on paint. Um, I mean, the, uh, uh, some of the structures uh, using sheet metal were, were galvanized. Um, a lot of the buildings like that customs house I showed you w was all made out of corrugated iron. And uh, the, 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 corrugate, the corrugated iron was, was galvanized. And it was normally thicker than the iron that's used now, but they'd be painted. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, the next question is from Richard um, from the UK, um, and he's asking if there was significant demand uh, from the South American youth to go to the United Kingdom to train as engineers. Um, the, the, the Quite a few Brazilians, uh, actually uh, some countries in South America actually did set up training for engineers and and actually compared to britain they actually had engineering schools before there were engineering schools in in britain oh, and one yeah. of there was a, a spectacular bridge in chile built in the 1890s by a chilean engineer who had worked with megs in peru um studied in 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 uh, santiago but then went and completed his engineering training in um, in Ghent in 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 Belgium, and and so uh, his bridge was actually manufactured by a, a French company, you, you know. So so that, that there were these connections. I, I think by the end of the nineteenth century, there were a lot of uh, well-trained engineers in those countries capable of doing a lot of this work, but. I think part of part of the the British influence was was actually to some extent um, it owed it, its existence to the fact that there was uh, financing coming from Britain. I mean, a, a lot of the people like Edward Woods probably never went to any of these places, but they actually had they were the people that were trusted by the bankers. They were trusted by the, the consuls and the agents from the countries to go and check the materials to make sure the contracts were right. You, you know, so it was a it was a kind of very complex ecology that, that, that kind of made these things possible. 
And, you know, uh, even if an engineer was very, very good from, from Chile or from Brazil or from Argentina, uh, the project that they might have done w would, m m wouldn't find finance all that easy. You know, and, and, and so, so, I mean, a, a, an interesting fact is that the, you know, as Britain was decolonizing after the Second World War, a lot of the, the railways in, in places like Argentina were nationalized, but they became nationalizing the railways became a, a kind of major political thing. So uh, imperialism of both kinds was uh, kind of having a hard time in the, in the 50s. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Um, we have a question from Margaret from the UK as well. Um, that asks, are there, uh, are these uh, early iron structures listed and looked after in the same way they were, uh, say, in the UK? Um, uh, look, it really, it really depends on, on where you are. I, I think uh, in, in Peru um, and Bolivia, there, it, there isn't a lot of, um, kind of support for that. In places like uh, Chile, um, the, 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 the monuments people in Chile are very, uh, you know, they, they, they do quite a lot of uh, documentation and reporting. And in some time, sometimes they put a lot of care into these things. Uh, uh, in in Bra Brazil is a country with a very strong heritage tradition. Um, it, it just it depends on what the focus is, and and the focus can change from time to time. So so the you know it's it's um, it's you can't generalize about it, and and it's something uh, it, it's kind of volatile. I mean sometimes there will be a lot of uh, attention paid to these things, and and then it could actually uh, kind of disappear for a while, all down to politics. Uh, thank you very much, um, Pedro. I think we've run out of questions. So, on behalf of the Institution of Structural Engineers, I'd like to thank you um, for preparing this amazing lecture and for uh, staying up at such a late hour or early hour. And also would like to thank Andrew um, for his guidance. Um, and perhaps we'll take this last question. We have one question that's just popped up. So we'll take this question, if that's OK, Pedro, and then we'll wrap up, um, unless I've been given different instructions. So the last question is from um, Wajahat Nasar uh, that is asking uh, if the British investment or was the British investment a neo-colonial move to replace the European continental history of colonialism? I don't know if I've read that correct. Uh, sorry, um, sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, look. They, I mean, it's um, the, the the involvement of of British engineering, finance. Um, and, and all the all the things that I've been speaking about, uh, including exports, was actually quite important. And and one of the one of the advantages for an imperial power was that they could get all the benefits without the the burden of administration. I mean, the the um, uh, some sometimes things kind of didn't work out. Like Peru actually ended up defaulting on enormous loans that it made uh, so uh, and and it i mean the shareholders in london sent people to to peru to to kind of look look into the into the whole business and 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 people continue to be paid into the 50s in fact there are some there are some residuals from those debts from the from the 19th century still being uh, administered today, so I mean that in some ways the the, the long arm of um, 
of, of dependence is, is, is in operation. But I don't think I understood the question exactly. Um, I think uh, you've given a good answer <laughs> as well as Andrew. Um, but I think this brings us to the end of the, uh, the talk. And we've, uh, I think we've answered all the questions now. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, Andrew and Pedro. Thank you very much. And uh, we will be uh, signing off very, very soon. And thank you to all our viewers. Well, look, thank you for uh, your forbearance. And I hope you found it interesting. I certainly uh, enjoyed putting it together. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much.